Welcome to Go See the Sky, coming to you this week from Quest University, Canada's first independent, not-for-profit university. On today's show, we'll tell you about its degree program and also other programs they offer here at the school for both older students and you high school students out there looking to further your studies. Uh, speaking of learning, though, this isn't the only place along the Sea to Sky corridor to get your teaching going. We'll tell you about on this week's show, a place in Whistler teaching you everything you need to know about olive oil. And later on the show, we'll also learn from one athlete what it takes to to win at this year's Whistler Cup. So what do you say? Let's get learning. All right, I'm here with Quest President David Helfand. And uh, David, thank you first of all for joining me on the show. It's my pleasure. Yeah, so let's talk about the university here, open since 2007. Uh, more attendance every year. You said around 600 are here for this year. But let's talk about your history with the campus. You kind of got it started, starting in 2005. Tell us a bit of that story. Well, I was originally called by David Strangway, who had been president of UBC and whose brainchild this was. And he wanted me to come out because they were starting a brand new university from scratch with a blank slate and saying, how should we design a university for the 21st century? And I was going to Seattle to do a fundraiser for Columbia University, where I was working at the time. And he said, well, just come up for a day. So my commitment was originally one day, and that was 10 years ago. <laughs> Always away. <laughs> That's what we get. So like you said, you designed it for 21st century. What does that mean? How is Quest University's program degrees different than other universities? In just about every other way. The point is, we live in an age called the information age. And that's because, unlike the rest of human history, information is now instantly accessible and free. Right? It's in your pocket. Two swipes, and you've got whatever you need to know. So the idea of education consisting of me pouring information from my full beaker into your little empty beaker and asking you to regurgitate it on command doesn't make a lot of sense when all the information's in your pocket. Right. So rather, what one has to do is equip students with a wide variety of intellectual tools, teach them how to analyze and validate data, and then to be creative in combining it in new ways that are of use to themselves or to society. Yeah, these days you need a whole facet of skills, like you said. And uh, that being said, so you only offer one degree, or arts and science, correct? Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about though, the actual way students learn here at Quest, different than other universities, it's more condensed by the sounds of it. Yeah, so our students take four courses in a term, but instead of taking them all at the same time, they take them in series. So you do one course for a month, nothing else. This gives you tremendous freedom. You go to class a minimum of three hours a day, five days a week, and have at least five hours of work outside of class every day. But most of that work is collaborative. And if you need to be out in the field, or you need to go on a field trip overnight, or for a week, or for the entire month, there's no problem because you have no conflicts with anything else. Yeah creates an immersive kind of learning which is just incomparable to what one can get in the semester system. Yeah, likely one we're going to see in more universities for sure. Well, some of them are adopting it. Hearst University in Ontario this September, after coming out here for three years, has switched their entire calendar to our calendar. My goodness, exciting things happening at Quest. We'll talk more in the show later on about um, other programs you offer for both adults in the community, high school students. But let's throw to our first story of the day here on Go See the Sky. Speaking of arts and learning, let's head on up to Whistler, where one group is teaching the three key to a good life. Eat, sleep, and art. One by one, Whistlerites from all walks of life file into their weekly figure drawing class. Day job behind them, pencil in hand, each is suddenly transformed into an artist. There's people who show up that are the regular locals, tattoo artists that are practicing their skills someone who's studied in fine arts, but they've never picked up a pencil for 20 years. So we'll do the usual, just maybe a couple short poses. We're gonna have Jennifer just draped a bit for now. We usually start with the really short poses, practice kind of just the gesture of the pose. It can be something that's just a simple line that identifies the curve of the body. And then as we develop, we start to add more of the muscle tone, the detail, the shadow. The age-old art, one of dozens of community programs offered here at the Whistler Arts Council's Millennium Place location. As the city's cultural hub for close to 35 years, the classes are as varied as its participants themselves, offering paint, drawing, photography, guitar, Spanish lessons, and more. For volunteers such as Sheila, it's about stepping outside oneself. Each sketch diving deeper into a world of self-discovery. It's nice, the common ground is art and drawing, and. People are coming that have no experience, which is really fun. 
My personal experience is I had a 9 to 5 drafting job, a lot of linear kind of drawing components and I came to life drawing just to break, break out of that. You meet a lot of different people and people you probably wouldn't talk to kind of just passing by. One of those people, Philippa, growing up immersed in the arts, taking drawing and pottery classes throughout high school, the Whistler marketer and avid biker felt a sudden need for expression. Living here, it's incredible. We have this amazing outdoor lifestyle. But after a couple of years, I realized that I, I needed something else. Like, I needed a balance. There's a little creative part of my brain that was saying, hey, look at me. Philippa signing up for the Arts Council's Introduction to Drawing program last year. This her second year figure drawing. Along with community programs, she's also in the process of writing a book, reawakening a childhood passion often buried with age. People are really intimidated by the thought of putting something of themselves out on paper again. Um, perhaps as you get older you start to judge yourself a little more. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. And the amazing thing, it's so easy to pick up a pen. As one of my good friends from my drawing group says, if you can write your name, you can draw. A positive sentiment the Arts Council hopes to pass along to writers as well, offering its first writing course this spring, co-taught by Rebecca Wood Barrett. The writing class that we're offering is open to new writers, emerging writers, to more experienced writers. It's meant to be a very encouraging class for anybody who is starting out um, and the craft components will help people move their writing forward. As a writing instructor in Whistler for the past 12 years, the TV producer and director aims to inspire others on the numerous benefits of the literary world. Our seniors, they have a life story that they want to tell. And then younger people generally want to, you know, explore the world and make up stories. I encourage people after the class to form their own group and keep going. No matter the mode of expression, each creation is a celebration of that support and self-discovery, one as valuable to the artist as the admirers themselves. It's unbelievable because you can see even just day by day and drawing a little bit by little bit, you can see how far you've come. It's like a record of your personal growth. It's a part of a balance, lifestyle, just as much as doing exercise and eating well. It's essential. The Arts Council's Craft of Writing Workshop takes place April 8th until May 13th. To sign up for their program or visit, uh, learn about more of their programs they offer, visit artswhistler.com. All right, well, David, speaking of writing, on top of your other courses you offer here, uh, you're having a Quest Writers Conference coming up in June here, first annual. Tell us about, about that program. Well, we have these wonderful facilities and this beautiful climate in the summer and we thought it's really a waste to leave them empty and so we're starting various kinds of programs in the summer, one of which this year is the first Quest Writers Conference. We're bringing in people from all over North America, Alicia Ostraker from New York, Joy Harjo, the First Nations poet from Oklahoma, uh, Oliver de la Paz, Rebecca Brown, a uh, whole bunch of writers who are here not just because they're award-winning writers and poets but because they really know how to run seminars and how to get the most out of workshops with new and emerging writers. Yeah, and it's quite intensive like your other uh, course you offer here. It goes from Sunday to Sunday, um, 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. Give us a rundown of how the each day uh, kind of works. Well, there'll be some time carved out for people to just work on their work because that's what writing is about. You have to do it by yourself. But there'll be small workshops, there'll be seminars. Every evening there'll be readings which will be open to the public uh, and as a consequence we'll create an entire milieu where people are just immersed in the art of writing. Yeah, and you can't get a better scenery for just that inspiration here in the Sea right. of Sky Corridor. And we'll tell you later on the show, we'll throw up a link where you can find uh, the address to sign up for all of the courses we're going to talk about today. But let's throw to our second story now here on Go Sea to Sky. Let's head on up to Whistler again, where did you know, along with being uh, full of antioxidants and healthy fats, olive oil is one of the healthiest foods for you on the planet. And as we find out in this next story, one of the most controversial. Olive oil, one of mankind's first cooking ingredients used as far back as 3000 BC. Its clear, almost tasteless substance, one the majority of consumers have come to expect. That is until stepping foot inside olives on tap in Whistler. We call it a tasting room or tasting bar. Do you know which balsamic you're after? Folks come in and they can actually try the product straight from the spout. That's awesome. Once uh, folks decide on a product in store, they choose their bottle size. We fill it up, 
And once it's filled, we fire a label on there as well so they know what their crush dates are and their chemistry. Persian lime and peppery grass, just two of over 25 olive oils, along with balsamic vinegars, offered at the newly opened Whistler Village store. Each calculated creation shipped in from olive farms around the world. A business idea that for Andrew Cameron was love at first sip. First olive oil tasting room in all of Canada was in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I'm from. I thought olive oil was tasteless and bland until I stepped into the store and started trying them. They're peppery, they're fruity, they're, they're spicy. There's so many different fruit contexts that, that come to life. A surprise that turns out he wasn't alone in. As olive oil ages, whether from overheating, the sun, or simply time, it loses its valuable antioxidants and flavor. However, with expired oil still edible, the kitchen staple remains the number one unregulated product on grocery shelves. They're looking for higher yields. Uh, to make more money. The problem is they drive the price point of oil down and it makes it harder for farmers who are actually kind of following the rules. If it's refined, you've lost all the, all the good stuff. You're kind of having a, a neutral or maybe even less than neutral product. And it isn't just olive oil. Turns out many makers are also adding molasses or brown sugar to wine vinegar to pass as balsamic. For Andrew and the now over a dozen olive oil shops in BC, putting an end to the corrupted industry begins with awareness. A good oil should actually be peppery, it should be bitter, it should be pungent, and it should have a fruit context. Something I had to try for myself. So Andrew, what's this one I'm about to try here? So this is a mild Arbisana from California. Easy going, not too much bitterness, not too much spice. Okay, let's try this here. I'm almost getting a hint of, initially I thought nut, but what is that? Yeah, it's kind of a green almond or a even kind of almost a bit of a green banana flavor to that one. Yeah, that's amazing. Next up, grass-infused extra virgin olive oil. Mm, nice and subtle. That subtlety about to be kicked up a notch. Olives on tap also injecting bold flavors such as pomegranate, chocolate, and blueberry into their vinegars. Here we go, this is blueberry. Oh, that's amazing. That's really good, actually. <laughs> With Olive on Tap's Whistler and North Vancouver location also offering group tastings, it's the continued reactions such as myself, Andrew has come to expect and thrive on. A lot of the time they go, I can't believe it can taste so good. So do you want a white instead of a dark? I'm hoping that people continue to get educated and that the industry continues to make better products. I think a lot of people on the ground uh, in retail shops are really trying to get the education out there to say, here's what to look for. If you thought that was a lot of flavor, get this. Olives on Tap's North Vancouver location offers over 50 olive oils and balsamic vinegars to try. Hard job, but someone's got to do it. If you'd like to learn more about their two locations, also different flavors they offer, you can visit them online at olivesontap.com. Well, don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. We've still got tons of great stories to bring to you on this week's episode of Go See the Sky, coming to you from Quest University. After the break, I feel like this year in particular, I'm more mentally stronger and I realize the competition's so much bigger. Christina Natalenko's race to the Whistler Cup. Welcome back from the break. We're here at Quest University with President David Helfen talking about the different programs they offer. A very exciting year here for Quest come spring and summer. We've talked about the Writers' Workshop being offered in June. Uh, now, David, tell us about the next one that adults in the community can come back and take if they've been out of school for five years. Renew your Quest. Yeah, so we've had so many parents come here with their children, drop them off or come visit them and just be so excited about what we're doing here and how much they wish they had this experience. And so we thought, well, why not give them that experience? And so for a week-long summer camp, if you will, uh, they live in the dorms, they eat in the cafeteria, they go to class every day with our faculty. Uh, in the afternoons, we have hikes and bike water rafting and things like that. And in the evenings, we cook some pretty nice dinners for them. Yeah, you really do get people here the full experience, which is awesome. Now, you mentioned uh, from modern China, global warming, it's an array of different classes adults can take. Um, are we seeing more adults just that wanting to learn? Kind of seems like different skills, really different from their usual day jobs. Are you seeing an increase in that among people? Yeah, well, this year we started a continuing education program for the local community. And we've had over 300 people register for courses ranging from 
wine tasting to global climate change. Uh, lots of interest in the community. The Renew Your Quest program, people come from all over North America and even outside North America sometimes, and it's really a, a great environment. In fact, the first year we did it, we thought it was going to be mostly parents, and it turned out to be three quarters academics from other universities wanting to come and see what we did here. So the discussions are pretty lively. Yeah, and, and I know people, you know, such as myself, young people, they have around, no offense, but <laughs> they have around uh, five different, um, different types of careers in their lifetime. So how important is it to kind of just that keep your skill set up as you age? Well, the point is that a lot of careers that our students who graduate today have haven't been invented yet. So you need to prepare them to be flexible and open and creative about how they're going to perform, not in a career they can train for the skills they need tomorrow, but for the habits of mind they need to learn for a lifetime. Yeah, awesome. Well, we'll talk more about those students uh, after this story. We'll tell you about other programs they offer here for high school students. But let's throw to our third story of the day here. The athlete in our next story is likely a little too busy to do any extra studying these days. With Whistler Cup less than a month away, we spoke to one of this year's top competitors, Christina Natalenko. Like most competitive alpine skiers, Christina Natalenko likes to go fast. Really fast. When you're going so fast and you can hear like the whistling in your helmet, you're racing the world, kind of. It's a feeling you can't really describe. That love of speed taking the 15-year-old athlete halfway around the globe. Natalenko having recently returned from competing in the world-renowned Tomplino ski race in Italy. However, her biggest accomplishment? Being the only BC athlete to win an Alpine medal at this year's Canada Winter Games, nabbing silver in the GS competition. That's something I'm going to remember. I was really surprised, but I was really happy because GS isn't my strongest event, but I was, I was still far behind from the girl who won, but I know what to work for now. <laughs> Doing just that, training five days a week in the gym or here outside her new Westminster home, the lifelong skier also hitting the slopes throughout the week with the Grouse Mountain Tai Ski Club. Her next challenge, the 23rd annual Whistler Cup. There's all these countries together and you're racing different people and you don't know how you're going to do. Just have to try your best and go as fast as you can. And meeting all these people, just amazing. <laughs> my goals for this is I just try my best and ski like I normally do. Don't get my nerves in the way of my skiing because that happens a lot to me. Just have to listen to my coach and just go full attack. This the Ukrainian-born athlete's last year competing in slalom, giant slalom, and Super G U16 races. Natalenko moving up to the U18 FIS program next year. With Austrians and Italians continuing to be her toughest rivals, the stronger she gets, so does the competition. Italians are someone they'd come down and just be so much ahead in different style of skiing. Especially on like an icy pitch, you'd notice that if you don't have enough leg muscle, you won't be able to hold the turn or if you don't have enough like strength or like a start. A good start matters a lot, so you need arm strength and muscle for a good jump start. I feel like this year in particular, I'm more mentally stronger and like I'm more open to what my coaches say and I try to train harder and I realize the competition is so much bigger and I actually have to <laughs> train which is what she'll continue to do, Natalenko's ultimate goal to one day compete in the Olympics. However, for now her eyes remain on Whistler, competing in the sport she loves, having fun along the way. I just want to be happy, like keep loving skiing and be able to enjoy it and train every day and just make sure I learn something every day from each experience in skiing, yeah, improve. I'm not thinking of results. That's, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, things to work on. I'm Vanessa Ibera in New Westminster for Shaw TV. Over 20 countries are set to compete in this year's Whistler Cup, taking place April 3rd until 5th up at Whistler Mountain there. To learn more about the sport, you can visit WhistlerCup.com. And that being said, be sure to watch our special Whistler Cup show as well, taking place mid-April. We're going to be covering all the festivities taking part, award ceremonies, races, and of course, the after parties. Well, don't go anywhere. We still have got tons of great stories to bring to you and learning to do on this week's edition of Go See the Sky, coming to you from Quest University. Coming up, a lot of us have an antique piece. 
I really like to show people how they can use it in their living room. Turning old into new, the personal inspiration behind Bungalow 968. And thanks for joining us once again here on Go See a Sky, talking all things academic here at Quest University with President David Helfen. Uh, David, so yeah, we've touched on numerous programs we offer, but a really cool thing I never had heard of where I grew up in Lower Mainland, you offer courses here for high school students as part of your Summer Scholars Program. How long has that been running and what's that one all about? We started that the year after we opened, actually, so it's been, this will be our seventh summer. Uh, it's for students in finished grade 10 through 12. And originally we sort of anticipated it as some way to help recruit students because they'd see what a beautiful campus we have, they'd see the faculty that they get to work with. Um, but in fact, now we have people flying in from all over the world. Uh, many people in the Summer Scholars Program do end up coming to Quest, but most of them don't. Uh, we offer programs ranging from songwriting to food to Latin American studies to uh, just a wide variety of things. They're week-long courses. Again, the students live in the dorm, eat in the cafeteria, go to class in the morning, there's no homework. Uh, and in the, in the evenings, in the afternoons, they go on hikes, they go rock climbing, they do lots of things with our students. And then in the evenings, there are workshops on everything from web design to videography to photography, things like that. So we keep them busy all day and all night. Yeah, and so just have people coming from all around the world though, but in my mind, kind of, why would they travel halfway around the world to, to take these courses? Are they not offered these kind of things in their own countries? Well, I don't know. We've had people from Europe and from Brazil and from Mexico and lots from the U.S. Um, sure, it's a special kind of thing, though. It's a week long. It's in a beautiful setting. Uh, and it, they're kind of courses that are attractive to people, I guess. We yeah. fill them up every year. Yeah, and speaking of those courses, um, in my mind, I'm just curious. Today's students, do you think they have just had too many choices? They can't quite whittle down what they want to do? Or is it the opposite, that most high school students have no idea, and that's what these courses are for? We're, we're kind of high school students today. Yeah, we, we like to broaden people's horizons. So in high school, your curriculum is usually pretty well set for you. Uh, but we think that creativity and learning needs to be broad. It needs to be hands-on. And so that's the kind of education we emphasize here for students. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, well, so to our last story of the day here on Go See the Sky. Uh, speaking of learning all that good stuff, another great way to learn about history, which they do here at Quest, is through vintage collections, a hobby that for one Squamish woman can't get any closer to the heart. Placing each plate gently with care, Meg McClure begins to set her dining room table for her evening dinner party. I definitely bring out everything when when people are coming over. I think it's important to use those things. Bring the nice fancy flatware out and just enjoy it. This set of flatware, especially close to Meg's heart, the custom collection, complete with matching plates, saucers, and teacups, one of dozens her mother proudly pulled out for Christmas and other holiday dinners growing up. It was very traditional. Everything was in fancy china cups and fancy teapots. I think that my mom just took so much pride and onus and ownership in, in making everybody feel really calm and welcome. Meg inspired to create that feeling of warmth in her own home, the then Alberta teen beginning to collect vintage items of her own throughout town. As their love of the antique world continued to grow, so did their bond. Until one day, Meg's mother suffered a heart attack, passing away at the age of 47. It was tough for sure. It's still tough. You still wish that she was, she would be around for those moments, like seeing my daughter or you know getting married, and you just still wish that she would be around. Instead, the then 18-year-old turned to the next best thing, scouring Alberta as well almost every BC antique and auction house, adding to her collection throughout the years. From an old Baker scale, early 19th century typewriter, 7-Up fan, and more, Meg sought comfort in her findings. However, as her heart began to fill, so did her house probably about a little over a year ago, and I thought, why have I been collecting all these things? There has to be a reason. One day that clutter turning to clarity. It was kind of an aha moment, and I went, oh, I should share these. Meg launching Bungalow 968 in 2014, a vintage rental company lending classic pieces for wedding, birthday parties, bridal showers, and more along the Sea Sky Corridor, a good portion of them her mother's. Definitely a certain demographic that really wants it. 
especially in Pemberton. There's a lot of brides that really like that kind of rustic vintage feel, whether it's like a wooden milk crate or an old window frame. Many of those pieces becoming staples among the local event scene. Our Royston Hutch is very popular and it has been to quite a few weddings. Currently one of my pieces is at the Railway Museum in the tea room. Along with renting out items, the Squamish Curator also sells custom refinished furniture as well teaches painting workshops throughout the community, helping anxious family members breathe new life into left behind belongings. A lot of us have an antique piece that was our grandmother or our parents. You want to use it but you don't know what how. I really like to help people along in that process and show them how they can actually use it in their living room. I definitely kind of look at all of them and go, wow, I wonder where that was. I wonder if that hat box was on the Titanic or traveled across Europe on a train. They all have such a unique story. Meg's own story turning pain into New Life's passion, one she's proud to share. Her mother's veil and wedding dress, now the trademark photo for Bungalow 968. Her company name also paying tribute to the house number she grew up in. It's that appreciation for the past she hopes to pass along to others, with a little help along the way. I'm really thankful that I'm able to bring that beauty and history and her pieces into my work and into my daily life. I'm really appreciative of that. So she still lives on. She lives through me. You can view all of Meg's vintage items at the Refresh Market taking place April 25th here in Squamish. To learn more about Squamish's largest indie marketplace, you can visit refreshmarket.ca. And of course, you can also view all of Meg's items online at bungalow968.com. Okay, well, David, a lot of learning's been done here as well at the university and uh, today, I should say. Speaking of which, it sounds like your fall 2015 program is almost full already for your degree program. Tell us some of the applications you've gotten already. Yeah, well, the growth has been pretty impressive. We started with 73 students and 7 faculty, and this fall we'll have 725 students and 50 faculty. Uh, this year alone we have 885 applications, and we only have 180 beds left. All our students live on campus all, all four years, and so the beds dictates the number of students we can accept. But we do accept, accept students for January starts, and of course it's not too early to start thinking about fall of 2016 for those who are eager to come to this university. It's not how quick the year flies for sure. Of course if you want to sign up for any of their courses as well you can visit Quest University online. We've got the link on the bottom of the screen there for you and you can also find them on Twitter. Well thank you so much David for joining me today. Oh, it's been yeah, my pleasure. I really opened my eyes for the university here. And that being said be sure to also follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. Let us know other things you'd like us to cover here at Quest University. Also other events happening around town. You can find us on both social media sites at Go See the Sky. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Ibera.